All right. Well, before I get uh, to the talk, uh, let me make sure that everyone has an opportunity to download the lecture notes if you want them. I, uh, I create a PDF file that, uh, that contains all the lecture notes that I will be using tonight. All you have to do is point your cell phone at that QR code. It'll a pop-up will come up that allows you to download that file, a PDF. So, at the end of my talk, I will put up another code that, uh, that will link you to a quiz. So if you want to go in and take a little online quiz, I'll have a quiz there for you at the end. I use these uh, lectures at uh, Cedar Park Christian Schools where I teach, and uh, my students uh, take the quizzes as well. So you better, be, better do better than them. That's what I'm thinking. That's my thinking. All right, yeah, look forward to a quiz at the end of the talk as well. Okay, so one of our main goals in, a, in a, the apologetics that we deal with here, what we call typically call creation apologetics, is that we attempt to reconcile the conflicts between what is taught today by natural science and what is taught by the Bible. Now, you know, within this, please keep in mind that what is being taught today by natural science, and, and particularly what we call natural history, is, are not facts, but these are merely interpretations of scientific findings. So if when considering your, for yourself what you can accept about natural history, it's important to understand the significance that worldviews have on a person's interpretations. Everyone has a worldview, a way of viewing the world. It's inescapable. Everyone has one. It's the way you make sense of the world, is you adopt a view of the world. And then everything that you see is interpreted within this worldview, is interpreted based on your worldview. Well, scientists also have a worldview, and they interpret everything they see within their worldview. Unfortunately, the vast majority of scientists today have a flawed or false worldview, the worldview of naturalism. So we need to be, uh, we should today recognize this and uh, be very skeptical about what scientists are teaching today, in particular re regarding ancient earth history or origins. If they have a false or flawed worldview, then their interpretations are more likely to be flawed, and uh, we should be very skeptical about what they're teaching today in terms of, uh, in particular, again, uh, what they call natural history. Well, the biblical worldview provides us with some tremendous insights about this world. For example, uh, knowledge of the global flood is key today in understanding the geology of the world that's around us. The book of Genesis describes a terrible flood that was sent by God due to the sin that was on the earth in those days. And there are two important points here for consideration that are stated emphatically by the text, that the, this flood was a global scale event, number one, and that no animal or human survived this event except those that were saved by God through the instructions he gave to Noah. Let's read the text. And the waters prevailed so mightily upon the earth that all the high mountains and the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, birds, cattle, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm upon the earth, and every man, everything on dry land, whose nostrils of the breath of life died. Now today, natural scientists say there has been no global flood, that there, is no, there was no global flood. But let me ask this question. If there was an event like the one that's described in Genesis, what else would we expect to find other than what we actually find? We live on top of a flood wasteland. The evidence for this event is monumental, and everywhere we look, we find flood deposits, massive level flood deposits everywhere we look. The world is covered in sedimentary rocks that are hundreds of feet thick, laden with the fossils of dead plants and animals. However, when we consider the extent of the flood described in the Bible being global and how life was saved from the destruction through Noah's Ark, an act of supernatural intervention, it should not be hard to understand that the physical findings of this event could not be correctly interpreted without some very special insights, insights that we have gained from the Bible. Life was saved from the flood by God's actions, an act of, again, of supernatural intervention that altered the otherwise certain natural outcome of the event. That would be the death of all terrestrial life. God told Noah there was going to be a flood, told him how to build the ark, the, and brought the animals to him to be kept alive. It specifically, specifically says the animals will come to you to be kept alive. When we consider the extent of the flood described in the Bible, and again, how life was saved supernaturally, 
it shouldn't be hard to recognize that a natural scientist, a person rigidly bound to naturalism, would not be able to interpret this event correctly. Preventing this natural outcome precludes or prevents a correct interpretation of the event uh, within uh, the boundaries of naturalism. To a naturalist, there is only one other possible interpretation of geology, and that's those layers of rocks had to form slowly and gradually over long periods of time. Well, not only do secular scientists not have special insights like we have gained through God's Word, but most are operating within a flawed worldview. Much of scientific inquiry today is based on atheistic worldview, the belief that there is no God. When atheism is applied to the understanding of the world that's around us, it has led to what we call philosophical naturalism. That is the view that everything came into existence through purely natural processes and that all physical phenomena must be interpreted as occurring through purely natural processes. This is what we call philosophical naturalism. This is the position that has been adopted by the scientific community. That is why they call our, uh, the, that's why they call a scientist today, another name for a scientist today is a naturalist. Charles Darwin was an unpaid naturalist on board the HMS Beagle, and that's why we call our science museums natural history museums. So they're not pure science museums. I mean, science, scientists aren't really, you know, when you get right down to it, science is no longer just about exploring chemistry and physics and biological systems to understand how those happen. Science has got itself involved in teaching history, and they're teaching us a speculative history of the world. A history of the world that they say came about through purely natural processes. Well, when this view of naturalism was applied to geology, this is ultimately what gave rise to what we call uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism. Which is in stark contrast to the prior interpretations of geology, which is what's called catastrophism. Catastrophism was the view that the Earth's geologic features were interpreted through major catastrophic events, most notably the biblical global flood. Geology, the geology of the world prior to around the early 1800s was interpreted as having occurred through the global flood that was described in the Bible. However, around 1850, a new view began to develop that slow and gradual processes with uniform rates of intensities were responsible for Earth's geologic features. Geologic features like the fossiliferous rocks that we find and erosion. This view became known as uniformitarianism. Well, the concept of uniformitarianism was ushered in by two champions of natural science, one James Hutton shown here and another by the name of Charles Lyell. We'll see him in a second. James Hutton was an anti-catastrophist who argued in his book in 1785 titled The Theory of the Earth for Uniformity of Causes to Explain the Earth's Geologic Features. He asserted that sedimentary rocks are the result of a cyclic process of erosion and sediment deposition, processes that he argued do not change over time. He summarized this view with his famous phrase, no vestiges of a beginning, no prospect of an end. With this view in mind, listen to this prophecy from 2 Peter about this very view. Peter says, Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following their own, own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Just what uh, James Hutton argued. That is the prophesied view that forms the basis of uniformitarianism, that all continues just as it was from the beginning. Now let's read on. For when they maintain this, he says, when they maintain this, for when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and, th and by water, through which the world at that time was deluged with water, deluged being flooded with water. It states that their worldview, note again, causes them to be willfully ignorant of this fact as it also reads, or as the ESV reads, causes them to del deliberately overlook the fact that the world was flooded with water. Well, in 1830, Charles Lyell argued in his book titled Principles of Geology for Uniformity of Intensity. He asserted that the same gradual processes occurring today were responsible for all Earth's geologic features. 
He summarized this with an oft-quoted saying, the present is key to the past. Charles Lyell wrote in an 1830 letter to his friend George Scrope about his agenda to free the science from Moses. He also heavily influenced Charles Darwin, who is said to have had a copy of Lyell's book with him on his famous voyage to the Galapagos Islands. Well, these two views, catastrophism versus uniformitarianism, are debated any time a person is trying to interpret geologic features, like those you see at Monument Valley, Utah. Are these sedimentary rocks that we see here the, the result of gra slow and gradual uniform rates of deposition that deposited all that sedimentary rock there, uniform rates of erosion that eroded away all that sedimentary rock that's now missing? Because understand that what you're looking at here is sand, the sandstone that's in this area is new rock. These are particles of sand that were transported this area and deposited there at least as high as the tops of those monuments originally, forming a vast floodplain. Then all the material that's missing eroded away. Did the deposit happen slowly and gradually? Did the erosion that material happen slowly and gradually? Or did this happen catastrophically? Well, catastrophism makes much more sense of what we see there, especially since all that sand is missing. Where did all that missing sandstone go? unless it was due to a catastrophic sweep away, or from the Grand Canyon. Did, uh, did the layers of the rocks we see at the Grand Canyon form slowly and gradually over long periods of time? Well, the fact that the geology of the global flood cannot be interpreted correctly by secular science uh, is, is key to understanding why we're debating this issue. Again, natural science is bound by rigid philosophical naturalism, and I argue that it's impossible for a naturalist to correctly interpret the geology of the world because the flood itself was not a purely natural event. When they're trying to interpret features that they see, they're trying to interpret these from within the boundaries of naturalism, but it cannot be done. When they look at these vast layers exposed in the Grand Canyon, Again, what did the grand, did these layers of rocks form slowly and gradually over long periods of time, as they argue, or did they form catastrophically? Was the Grand Canyon formed slowly and gradually over long periods of time or catastrophically? They argue for slow and gradual deposition and slow and gradual erosion. But I argue that it's impossible for a geologist today that's rigidly bound to naturalism to correctly interpret the geology of the world. Because again, remember, this event was not purely natural. Not only did God cause the event, but more importantly, the animals and humans that survived this event did not survive it naturally. They survived it due to an act of supernatural intervention. This precludes or prevents a naturalist from interpreting the geology of the world correctly. Because when they look at layers like those you see here in the Grand Canyon, they're not just trying to interpret those layers, but the world as it now exists. On top of those layers of rocks, life exists. Lots of life. Lots of fragile life that would be completely unable to survive an event capable of laying down all of those layers in a, in a single event. It simply couldn't happen. But the Bible says there was just such an event, an event that nothing could survive except for those that were on board Noah's Ark with Noah. So the fact that life was saved from this event through an act of supernatural intervention prevents a geology for correctly interpreting the geology of the world. They must instead propose that the life on top of those vast layers today survived it naturally or on their own, which means those sediments had to accumulate slowly and gradually over long periods of time at a rate or in a manner that life could have survived it naturally. They can never correctly interpret the geology of the world. Well, as a result of adopting uniformitarianism, most geologists today are highly biased against flood catastrophe as an explanatory mechanism for, for, to explain Earth's geology. This bias is well illustrated by the story of Harlan Bretz. In, in the 1920s, Harlan Bretz, shown here, proposed that features in eastern Washington must have been informed by large catastrophic flooding, large-scale catastrophic flooding of catastrophic proportions. He named the area of eastern Washington that he studied the Channel Scablands where there are found huge channels like, the, like you see here erode, that are eroded through solid basalt or volcanic rock. And this is an area that sees very little moisture. We see these vast channels having been carved. Or massive geologic features can be found there, such as these coolies, massive canyons. 
The coulee that you see here reaches four miles wide and 900 feet deep. Well, Harlan Brett's asserted that these coulees could only have formed if this entire canyon was filled full of water at one point in time because they have very flat bottoms and very straight sides. He argued that this canyon was formed during a major catastrophic flood. And this is an area that has seen a lot of erosion. As you can see from this map, the area in question is vast where these channels and coulees can be found. A good 120 miles across, we're talking about. Now, the light blue where, that you see here on this map shows where these features are found today, these erosion features. The dark blue lines are where water is found there today. So you can see a lot of erosion has happened there in the past. It's a vast amount of erosion. The channels are cut so deep through solid basalt that they are visible from satellite. There's a satellite photo of those vast channels and coulees that you can see there out of the channel scablands. However, the geologic community initially thought the hypothesis was outrageous and refused the idea of catastrophic flooding because most geologists side with the principles of uniformitarianism and are themselves anti-catastrophist. Although the Chabland features display an obvious witness to a major catastrophic flood, Harlan Bretz was subject to scorn for the suggestion due to the strong bias that geologists have against catastrophic flood interpretations of geology because of their desire to free the science from Moses, just as Charles Lyell said. In an article published in the Seattle Times in 2003, it speaks to the plight of Harlan Bretz. They said, mystified by the forces that could have exposed such massive features, Brett set on the early 1920s to solve the riddle. He re returned with the hypothesis that was dismissed as near lunacy. In a region that sees less moisture in a year than Seattle gets in a month, Brett's concluded that the entire landscape was carved by water. Brett's, according to some reports, was quickly isolated as a crank, a crazy person, while his critics' theories continue to make it into textbooks. Fifty years later, however, Brett's was hailed as a hero, and in 1979, at the age of 96, he was given geology's highest honor, called the Penrose Medal, which rewards one researcher each year for exceptional contributions to geology. Two years later, he passed away. Well, today, it is well recognized that the Channel Scablands was caused by a major catastrophic flood, a flood that they call the Missoula Flood, uh, called that because the body of water that caused this flooding was located around today what is today Missoula, Montana. A massive Ice Age lake formed that was blocked from drainage, presumably by a large glacial dam that ruptured at some point in time and the entire body of water, 3,000 square mile lake, plowed across Washington in just about two days, destroying and reshaping the U.S. landscape from Montana all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Many of the larger scabland features could, cannot be identified while standing on the ground. And it was, in fact, seeing these features from airplanes that eventually convinced geologists that Harlan Brepps was correct. Only from the air are the rolling hills, for example, near Spokane, identified as giant ripple marks, similar to those that can be seen along a beach or a lakeshore. But these hills are 30 feet high and 250 feet apart. They just look like hills from the ground, but when they were viewed from airplanes, it became clear that there was a symmetry there that reminded them of ripple marks, and in fact, that's what they are. The, this, uh, the Missoula flood also carved out the Columbia River Gorge. And again, it's just a couple of days. And if you've been to the Columbia River Gorge, you know it's a massive erosion feature. The flood transported tons of material from eastern Washington to the Willamette Valley in Oregon. Large boulders and rocks carved down, that were carried down the Columbia River Gorge can still be seen near Portland. Large gravel bars were formed near Portland, such as those where the Alameda Ridge neighborhood is built upon today. You can go see some of these large boulders they call erratics at the Erratic Rock State Natural Site in, the, in Willamette Valley of Oregon. These are rocks that were carried by this flood from the Channel Scablands area all the way to Oregon. The area where Portland stands today was completely underwater during the flood. Floodwaters were over 400 feet deep and traveling at over 90 miles per hour during the flood and are said to have been equal to 10 times the discharge that is currently found in all the Earth's rivers today. 
plowing across Washington in just a couple of days. During the Missoula flood, a massive waterfall formed where there is now a, the Dry Falls State Park and Visitor Center. An artist's rendition of the falls, uh, the waterfalls that was occurring during the flood, can be found there on, the, on that, one of the handrails at the site. Now, just to give you a better perspective on how big this is, I took a video out there the last time we were out there on one of our field trips, but even it doesn't really help you ca help capture the scale. So for comparison, Niagara Falls is one mile wide and drops 165 feet. If you've ever been to Niagara Falls, you know it's a massive, massive waterfall. By uh, comparison, the waterfall at Dry Falls State Park was three times the size, 3.5 miles wide and over 400 feet a 400 feet drop, massive, massive waterfall that formed this enormous geologic feature. And as I pan to the right, you can see one of those massive coolies that you see there. Well, in 1994, the Dry Falls Visitor Center was dedicated to Harlan Bretts. This plaque can be found mounted outside the facility. It reads, dedicated to Harlan Bretts, who patiently taught us that catastrophic floods may sometimes play a role in nature's unfolding drama. And then there's a quote from Hardin Bretz who said, Ideas without precedent are generally looked upon with disfavor, and men are shocked if their conceptions of an orderly world are challenged. Well, note that it took geologists more than 50 years to acknowledge that the geologic features of eastern Washington were the result of catastrophic flooding. This bias against catastrophism in geology is obviously di driven by their determination to counter the biblical narrative of the flood of Noah which has and is currently preventing the whole of the geologic community from correctly interpreting geologic features that are themselves otherwise fairly easy to recognize. Well, with an understanding that this bias exists in geology, we should be very skeptical about the interpretations of fossils that is taught as a matter of fact today by natural science. Today, fossils stand as the main observational evidence for the theory of evolution because it has been observed that there is a typical order or arrangement of fossils in the layers of rocks we call strata, wherein certain fossils are found typically below or above other types of specific fossils. <clears throat> Evolutionists argue that this arrangement of fossils records the history of life on Earth over hundreds of millions of years and shows that life on Earth has changed over time from simple to complex forms. But this fossil sequence is not truly set in stone. Fossils are frequently found out of place, often by millions of years. The fossil record, in fact, described by paleontologists, is really better understood as a statement of evolutionary thinking or a model of how evolutionists propose fossils should be. However, through insights gained from the Bible, the fossiliferous strata stands as a monumental body of evidence for the global flood. The earth is covered in flood sediments that are hundreds of feet thick and laden with the fossils of dead plants and animals, like the layers exposed again here in the Grand Canyon. In places, these sedimentary rocks reach kilometers of thickness. And these rocks, these rock layers, stretch for hundreds of miles, and some can be traced for thousands of miles all the way from one side of the continent to the other. This map from the U.S. Geologic Survey diagram shows how the layers that are found there at the Grand Canyon, all the way over in the right to this diagram, extend south across Utah through both Zion and Bryce National Parks. These layers extend for hundreds and in some cases thousands of miles. The Tapete Sandstone, shown there at the Grand Canyon, extends over much of North America, shown by this diagram. And when you consider that the Tapete Sandstone is a turbidite deposit, a type of, of a sedimentary rock that forms uh, through underwater landslides called turbidity currents, the evidence this provides for a continental-wide catastrophe is overwhelming. Well, this type of continental-wide coverage by fossil-bearing rocks is the norm. It's not an isolated incident. It's the norm, as shown in this map by the Ge U.S. Geological Survey and is in fact a law of stratigraphy called the law of lateral continuity. Flood deposits blanket the continents, except for erosion and uplift have removed those layers. But 
If secular geologists could not recognize the Missoula flood due to its immense size, consider how can they recognize the geology of a global scale flood? The Missoula flood, remember, escaped their notice, as it says in 2 Peter 3-6, through because of their incorrect worldview, and they are certainly going to deliberately overlook the fact that the entire geologic record is due to a global scale flood. Well, what this diagram that I'm showing you here actually is, is a, a diagram showing the layers of the fossil record that are on the surface in North America, the fossil record that is more formally called the geological column. Now, natural science argues that these layers represent different geologic periods of time, separated by millions of years. However, take a look at this map, and I'm going to point out something to you here, just how much geologic time is missing over much of it. Look, look at where the red is up there in Canada, and look where it is on, the, on the, the, the legend there that's at the right. Look where the red is labeled on, the, on that legend, and look where it is there, up there in Canada. So in their interpretation, all of the geologic periods above those red layers is missing throughout the entirety of Canada. You're talking about Two billion years of geologic time is missing from all of that area up in Canada that is covered in red. That's a massive amount of missing geological time. However, if we interpret the fossil record from within the biblical worldview, then the sorting, the sorting of fossils that has been found by paleontologists is almost certainly due to the successive destruction of various types of habitats during the global flood. As the floodwaters rose higher and higher on the earth, it destroyed lower habitats and then higher habitats and then ever higher habitats, these habitats that we call biomes. And that's almost certainly what we're looking at, what was responsible for the sorting, sorting of fossils. The reason why some fossils are found typically below or above other fossils is because the flood, remember, was an extended event. It, didn't, it wasn't just a 40-day event. That 40-day rain tends to stick in our mind. It lasted for 150 days. From the 17th day of the second month of Noah's life to the 17th day of the seventh month of Noah's life, 150 days was the extent of the, of the time that was required for the flood to eventually cover the mountains. 150 days. It grow, gradually rose higher and higher on the earth. With this in mind, let me show you something interesting. Okay, um, Next to this map that again shows the layers of the fossil record, that are on the surface in North America, I'm going to place a map of the present-day biomes or the types of habitats that are found in North America. Look at this. Look at how closely those maps align. That's because that is all the fossil record is. It is the destruction of successive habitats by rising waters during the biblical flood. See how closely those maps align. Interesting, right? Well, we also find ocean fossils everywhere. I'm, gonna sh I'm trying to, uh, myself to argue from the fossil record that it's best interpreted by way of the global flood. And uh, one of these powerful evidence for this is the fact that ocean fossils can be found everywhere. On the top of literally every mountain chain in the world, except where mountain mountains that have punched up through the sedimentary rocks, like your volcanic mountains, you can find ocean fossils. They're on the tops of the Andes, the tops of the Alps. You climb up there, and you can find ocean fossils. Clams are blooming everywhere. Well, well the fact that ocean fossils are found on the tops of mountains is not the big deal, though, really, because mountains build. A floodplain can be lifted up and become a, a high-lifted plateau or in, on the top of a mountain. So the fact that Fossils are on the tops of mountains is not the big deal. They are found throughout the fossil record. Literally in every single layer of the fossil record, you find marine fossils or ocean fossils. Unlike the idealized diagram in the fossil record, like the one I show you here, the real fossil record is comprised almost entirely of ocean fossils. 95% of all fossils are marine invertebrates, primarily shellfish. 95% of the remaining 5% are plants. 95% of the rest are fish, most of the rest are insects. The reality is that much less than 1% of the fossils in the fossil record are land vertebrates. It is clear that the fossil record was formed when the oceans inundated the terrestrial habitats, causing land and marine organisms to be buried together. Whenever we find land animals, we almost always find uh, ocean fossils mixed right there with it. 
If we interpret these findings consistent with the Bible, it is clear that it was due to a single extended global scale event. Or if interpreted within the boundaries of philosophical naturalism, repeated inundations of the oceans would be necessary and are claimed to have happened due to, the, due to repeated ice ages, that the oceans came in and the oceans went out. The problem is you just don't, just don't find ocean fossils on the outer edges of the continents in the fossil record. You find them covering the continents. And that's very difficult to explain, how the ocean came in, covered the continent, and went back out, and then animals, land animals, continued to survive and evolve throughout these repeated inundations by oceans. Well, rapid and recent catastrophic burial by sediments is also strongly supported by discoveries of fossilized soft tissues. Now, geologists claim that fossilization requires millions of years. Many fossils, however, have been, found, have been discovered that still contain preserved soft tissue that simply could not survive for long periods of time. Some have been found with fully articulated skeletons, like the fish I show you here, soft fleshy parts such as skin, cartilage, Unborn fetuses have been found, stomach contents. Recent and rapid burial by sediments is strongly supported by fossilized soft tissues. Due to the rapid rate of decomposition, such fossilized soft tissues are clear proof that they were buried rapidly by sediments, not over long time periods. Delicate structures like eyes and soft feathery appendages are preserved in fossil forms. Many of them are identical to animals and plants we have today. They're often found so well preserved that we can identify them by species. Again, delicate structures like the membranous wings of a dragonfly and compound eyes are preserved in the rock record. Trilobites, which is what you see here, are extinct creatures, but their eyes were so well preserved in fossil specimens that it enabled paleontologists to learn about their unique eyes. And this specimen was buried so quickly by sediments that it didn't have time to even retract its eye stalks. They have eyes up on eye stalks just like uh, snails. Didn't have time to even pull in his eyes. Well, the problem with finding fossilized soft tissue like stomach contents is that animals don't just lie around waiting for sediments to slowly cover them, allowing for fossilization. When a, an animal or plant dies, decomposition is a very rapid thing, and it's a necessary part of an ecosystem to make those materials again available to the next generation. Predators and scavengers will feed on the fleshy parts of the body. Bacteria and fungi, the decomposers, are responsible for breaking down most of the remains. And then chemical reactions like oxidation make short work of, the, of what's left, and it becomes dust in the wind in no time at all. Only rapid and massive burial by sediments is sufficient to, to explain soft tissues. It Rapid and massive burial will slow decomposition and allow for fossilization. For many fossils, it is clear that they were killed by the sediment, sedimentary flows that entombed them. Once buried by sediments, water infused with minerals must then be present for mineralization to take place. Water that's saturated by minerals has to trickle through where that bone or shell was to eventually deposit minerals as the bone or shell decays, creating a rock-like copy of the, of the uh, original animal. So it had to be buried by sediments rapidly, like in a catastrophic event, and water laden with minerals has to be present for mineralization to take place. Both of these are processes that we would expect during a flood. Some animals have been found that were... <clears throat> that were buried so quickly by sediments that their fossil record records a snapshot of a moment in time. This fish was buried before it had time to finish gulping down its meal. Thus, it became the petrified Last Supper. <laughs> this ichthyosaur, an extinct marine reptile, was in the process of giving birth when buried by sediments, allowing the event to be, become fossilized. Lots of animals thought to have gone extinct 65 million years or more have been discovered with soft tissues like the hadrosaur that you see here with skin still intact and a fully articulated skeleton. We've also found cartilage and uh, stomach contents from hadrosaurs. Stomach contents were in fact so well preserved in a number of extinct animals that paleontologists were able to identify their diets and therefore their habitat. The hadrosaur a duck-billed dinosaur was once thought to be semi-aquatic. 
because it had a duck-like bill and they assumed that it used its mouth part the way that uh, waterfowl do, sifting through mud. So like this old picture shows, they were thought to be semi-aquatic, but analysis of stomach contents revealed that they forged in much higher elevations. They weren't aquatic or semi-aquatic at all. Well, hadrosaur bones have also been found that are not even mineralized. This toe bone is on display at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, which allows visitors to touch real dinosaur bone. The caption reads, this is real dinosaur bone from the hind foot of a genus of hadrosaur. Although it is 69 million years old, it is still original bone and not rock. Well, I hate to tell you, but bone doesn't lay around for 69 million years before it decomposes and decays. This notosaur date was, and, and tremendous discovery was made of a notosaur that is, dates back, according to conventional dating, 110 million years old. But it's so well preserved, it seems to be staring back at you from its exquisitely preserved eye socket that you see there. Skin was also preserved around its neck. Also note the spikes around its neck and shoulder, spikes that were up to 20 inches long. This thing was formidable. Wids, ribs were preserved in this notosaur. Stomach contents were preserved as well, showing the remnants of the dinosaur's last meal. Well, in 2005, a Tyrannosaurus rex was discovered in the Hell Creek Formation of Montana by North Carolina State University professor Dr. Mary Schweitzer. Well, due to its enormous weight, after wrapping this, the femur of this uh, Tyrannosaur in plaster Paris, they, uh, they couldn't, lift it, they couldn't uh, airlift it out of the area by helicopter as planned, so they broke the femur of this T-Rex in half to transport it out of the area. Well, upon unpacking the bones containing the... Uh, Un un uh, and unpacking the bones in her lab, she immediately noticed that the bone contained medullary tissue, which prompted further microscopic analysis. From the mineral cavity, Schweitzer found soft, flexible tissue that upon treatment could be stretched and would return back to its original form. Well, since the T-Rex is believed to have gone extinct 65 million years ago, soft tissue was completely unexpected. In her amazement, she also found what appeared to be blood vessels and what she believed were red blood cells with nuclei, typical of reptiles and birds, but not found in mammals. The vessels were even revealed to be lined with specialized bone endothelial cells. Well, initially, skeptical scientists suggested that what appeared to be blood vessels were simply bacterial biofilms. Bacteria will, will create a uh, Will, sec will secrete organic material that forms a film, and it was argued that this is all the, that these uh, parent blood vessels were. However, Dr. Schweitzer did some more work and, uh, and ultimately found collagen was present in these blood vessels, a material, a protein, that's found in vertebrates, but not something that's made by bacteria. So it appeared conclusive that what she in fact found were uh, were. T-Rex blood vessels and uh, red blood cells from uh, an animal that was got, thought to have gone extinct 65 million years ago. Well, soft tissues like these have now been discovered that date by conventional methods well beyond 100 million years. These discoveries are strong proof that these tissues are not that old, but were instead buried recently and catastrophically. Fossil graveyards are another powerful evidence of catastrophism as a mechanism behind the fossil record. The Dinosaur National Monument, which is shown here, is located in northwestern Colorado and straddles the border of Utah and protects a large deposit of dinosaur fossils belonging to at least 11 different kinds of dinosaurs. More than half of all the dinosaurs that have been discovered in North America are found in this one bone bed. Entire communities of organisms are found buried together in these bone beds, what we call mass mortality beds, again, support, supporting the catastrophic nature of the sedimentary flows that prevented them from decomposing and allowing them to become a fossil. Some of these fossils are, in fact, oriented. Now, these are nautiloids, and look at the scale of these things. Some of these nautiloids were absolutely massive, six to eight feet long, whereas their shells but they're oriented in one direction. It must have required a, a very unusual dynamic conditions such as rapid underwater flows of sediments to orient all these big nautiloids in one direction. 
Well, I believe there, when you examine the fossil record, you see that there is powerful evidence there for a global scale flood. But we also want to examine fossils to see if they truly show that evolution has taken place as they argue. Well, again, remember that the fossil record is one of the main lines of evidentiary supports for the theory of evolution, the theory that organisms have evolved over long time periods from simple to complex forms. Well, this, again, argument comes from the fact that fossils are typically found below or above other types of fossils, and that fossils have been sorted in this way. So they say, look, there's different fossils in this layer than the ones above. Life on Earth has changed over time. But is that enough to prove evolution? No. The fact that there's different plants and animals in one layer than there are in the ant layer above it doesn't show evolution. What they must show is an organism in the process of actually evolving. The fossil record should be filled with such evolutionary sequences. It should be filled with the fossils that we call intermediate fossils or transitional forms. But in fact, these are glaringly absent. But this is what they sh the fossil record must demonstrate for evolution to, truly be tr to be true. An animal in the process of evolving by way of the fossil record. Now, it's important to understand that Darwin himself did not invent evolution. Uh, he did not invent evolution. There were a lot of evolutionists of Darwin's day, and in fact, much of his views seemed to originate from his father. But most of the evolution of Darwin's day held to a different mechanism of evolution that they called saltatory evolution. They believed that, ev that organisms would, would evolve in rapid jumps. That's because when they looked around at living populations, they saw distinct groups of organisms, between which there were enormous gaps. I mean, there's a a bunch of different kind of reptiles. You got your turtles and tortoises, and you have your snakes, and you have your lizards, but there's, where there's no transitional forms between the turtles and the lizards, or between the lizards and the snakes. So they argued that evolution would occur in rapid jumps, what they called saltatory evolution. And of the animals they knew of in the fossil record, they also knew of only those distinct groups. So this was the reigning view of Darwin's day. One of Darwin's big challenges to the evolutionary thinking of his day was that he argued that the process must be slow and gradual. He attributed it to the same mechanism that was happening in breeding kennels across the country. Darwin himself was an accomplished breeder of pigeons. And he knew well the process that was involved with creating a new pigeon breed from a wild type pigeon and or horse breeds or dog breeds or cat breeds. These breeding histories are well known. And Darwin himself published on the breeding history of pigeons in one of his books. But he, so he attributed this artificial selection process that's happening in these breeding colonies by people to nature. And he called it natural selection. Well, if natural selection is the mechanism that's responsible for these changes, then it has to be slow and gradual and occur over long periods of time. And this is what he argued, that it's slow and gradual. But in the origin of species, he actually gives a carefully worded apology that he can't point to the fossils to prove his theory true. Of, this, of, the, of the fossils that they knew at that time, they were basically the same as the animals that were alive then. Well, he argued that these groups of animals were created by extinctions, that the reason where we just had turtles alive and, rep and reptiles alive and snakes alive was that the transitional forms between those groups had died due to extinction. But he predicted that although he could not point to the fossils during his day, that the fossils did exist and would be found. The question is, have they been found? Can they connect together these various types of animals or plants by way of transitional forms? Well, the answer to that is no. They've been searching for 150 years to fill in these gaps by way of fossil forms, and they have not found them. James Valentine is an evolutionary biologist at, at California University, and he makes this confession in, in what Darwin began. He says, the fossil record is of little use in providing direct evidence of the pathways of descent of the phyla or of invertebrate classes. Now, phyla, just so you know, are, the, are, are taxonomic groups like those represented on this slide. The cnidarians represented by, uh, for, for example, your jellyfish, the echinoderms, which are represented by the starfish, the mollusks represented by the clam, and or the arthropods represented by your trilobite there. These are various, the various phyla that he's talking about. Within these phyla are numerous classes. 
So within the um, mollusks, represented by the clam there, there's also cephalopods, which includes the octopus and squid, and you also have gastropods, which includes the snails. Okay, several different classes in, in each of these phyla. Okay, but one thing is clear, one thing is pretty obvious here, that these phyla are about as different from one another as animals could possibly be. And they are separated by enormous gaps. In addition, when these animals that we see here, like, the, like jellyfish, when they first appear in the fossil record, it's a perfectly formed jellyfish. There's no indication what evolved into the jellyfish. The first time we find them, they're perfectly formed jellyfish. No indication what evolved into the echinoderms like the starfish. The first time they appear, they're perfectly formed starfish. There's no evolutionary history showing what evolved into these creatures, and there's nothing connecting these creatures together. These phyla are as different as organisms can possibly be. But let, let's continue with Valentine. He continues, each phyla with a fossil record had already evolved its characteristic body plan when it first appeared, so far as we can tell from fossil remains, and no phyla is connected to any other via, via intermediate fossil types. But he continues, indeed, none of the invertebrate classes can be connected with another class by a series of intermediates. He said, not only can we not collect the phyla together, but we can't even connect the classes that are in those phyla together by way of a series of fossilized intermediate forms. They are simply not there. There is simply no evolution demonstrated by way of the fossil record for invertebrate phyla like those that we see here. The various phyla are, again, about as different as they possibly can be. They're separated from one another by enormous gaps. There's no fossil ancestry showing what evolved into them, and they're not connected together by fossilized intermediates either. And when these animals first appear in the... And understand, we're talking about highly, highly specialized animals. Aquatic animals are highly specialized for aquatic environments. Uh, flying creatures are highly specialized for flying environments. But when these animals first appear in the fossil record, they appear out of nowhere. Animals like bats suddenly appear in the fossil record as perfectly formed bats. There's no evolutionary history for a bat, and it's a highly specialized flyer. Or like the pterosaurs, the pterodactyls, there's no evolutionary history in the fossil record for pterodactyls either. The first time they appear in the fossil record, boom, they appear out of nowhere as a perfectly formed pterodactyl. Well, Stephen Jay Gould uh, was perhaps one of the most popular uh, evolutionists of our day, one of the most famous evolution of our, uh, evolutionists of our day, paleontologist, a fossil, uh, fossil guy. And I say this because he was uh, featured on an episode of The Simpsons. You know, to be a famous scientist today, that's what you have to be. You have to get a, have a cameo on one of our animated series. Well, uh, he says this regarding... He, now, he admits to the extreme rarity of transitional forms, and he says this. He says... The extreme rarity of transitional forms persists as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, he says. However reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. So this is Stephen Jay Gould, arguably one of the most famous paleontologists, evolutionary paleontologists of our day, admitting that the absence of transitional forms is a trade secret of paleontology. Well, Stephen Jay Gould went on to propose a new theory to explain the absence of transitional forms, a theory that he called punctuated equilibrium. Steve, uh, Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Eldridge proposed what they call punctuated equilibrium. They argued that once an animal becomes adapted to an environment, it will stay that way for a long period of time. And then when the environment changes, it'll evolve rapidly to try to adapt to those new changes. So he called this punctuated equilibrium. But I don't know if you heard, but it's basically saltation by a different name. Back in Darwin's day, they argued that organisms would evolve in rapid jumps, leaving no transitional forms. Darwin said, no, 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 no. This evolution must be a slow and gradual process, the same kind of slow and gradual process we see happening, have happened through dog breeding and pigeon breeding and horse breeding. So it must be slow and gradual. He said the fossils would eventually be found, argued that they would be eventually be found. They haven't been found. 150 years later, we haven't found the fossils. So paleontologists today are going right back to where they were back then, arguing for saltatory type evolution, what's, what they call punctuated equilibrium. The fact is, the slow and gradual process that Darwin envisioned should have left abundant fossils. 
But the evolutionary tree that is often shown without disclaimer is simply without fossil support. It's mostly inference, like Stephen Jay Gould said. Instead, what we find in the fossil record is, are the same distinct groups that we find in living populations. Despite an enormity of effort, the primitive ancestors of the various phyla have not been found in the fossil record, nor can evolutionists connect the various phyla to each other by transitional fossil forms. Well, there are other problems with the evolutionist interpretation of the fossil record, like the out-of-place fossils that have been found. Now, the geologic order of fossils described by paleontologists is, again, not set in stone. We find these out-of-place fossils. Uh, now, understand that what you're looking at by way of uh, what their interpretation is that the first time an organism appears in the fossil record is the time that it first evolved. The last time they appear in the fossil record is believed to, be, to them to be the time that it went extinct. Okay, but we can find lots of animals. We have found lots of animals whose last appearance in the fossil record was millions and millions of years ago, and they're still alive today. But one good example is the coelacanth. Now, the coelacanth predates the dinosaurs by millions of years in the fossil record and was once thought to have gone extinct 70 million years ago until it was discovered alive and well in 1938 by a fisherman. A fisherman captured one, brought it to shore, showed it that it was really weird, so they showed it around a little bit, and some expert realized that it was a living fossil. Well, we now know where these things live. They live deep in the Indian Ocean off the coast of Madagascar, and they have found like, caught like 80 of these at this point. They're really valuable because museums want them for specimens. But interestingly, the coelacanth was one of the evolutionist transitional forms. Now, the coelacanth is, is a group of fish that are called sarcopterygii. Uh, instead of the ray fin fish, it's actinopterygii. They have these, they're called the lobe fin fishes. They have these big, fat, fleshy fins. And the evolutionists said, oh, this animal must have evolved up on a life on land. Use those big, fat, fleshy fins to crawl up on land. Well, the reason why we didn't know that they were alive today is because they don't live on the continental shelf. They don't use those fat, fleshy friends for crawling along the bottom of the, of the continental shelf. They live deep in the Indian Ocean, which is why we didn't know they were alive. So, uh, well, let me show you some other uh, out-of-place fossils. This is the Wollumi pine. It was discovered in 1994 in the Blue Mountains near Sydney, Australia, after being thought to have gone extinct 150 million years ago, based on its last position in the, in the uh, geological column. Now, the ginkgo, was, uh, uh, the ginkgo was similar. The ginkgo was thought to have gone extinct 270 million years ago until it was discovered in Japan. In 1996, a Laotian rock rack was discovered being sold in a meat market in Laos. It was thought to have gone extinct 11 million years ago. In 2005, a mammal was found with a dinosaur in its stomach. Now, this discovery was shocking to paleontologists at the time because it was believed that mammals of this size did not live at the time of the dinosaurs. See, in order to convince them their proposed sequence of fossils is, is incorrect, you literally will have to find one in the belly of another because they can explain away out-of-place fossils. And they, they frequently explain them away by arguing that a secondary erosion event had taken place. Because, let me go back to a diagram of fossils, if you take a sequence of fossils like this and you start eroding it from the top, the top layer is going to erode off first and be deposited, and the layer that's beneath it will be eroded next and will be deposited on top of the other. So by, uh, through a secondary erosion event, you can completely invert an entire fossil sequence. And they argue away most of these out-of-place fossils by arguing that they were just due to, they're out of place due to a secondary erosion event. They literally have to find one of a belly of another to convince them they're wrong and that mammals actually lived during the times of the dinosaurs. Well, another major problem with the uh, secular interpretation of fossils is the enormity of living fossils that we have found. Now, living fossil is a name for an organism that is found in the fossil record but is still alive today alive today and identical to their fossilized specimens find lots of these, lots and lots of living fossils that date back a hundreds, hundreds of millions of years. Let me give you a few examples. Stingrays are found in the, is found in the fossil record that paleontologists claim uh, date back 50 million years, but they are identical to the stingrays we find today. Squids are found that date back 160 million years, but they're identical to the squids we have alive today. 
Lobsters date back 200 million years, they're still the same. Cockroaches date back 250 million years, they're, sti they're still the same. Shield bugs are the same, or stink bugs, as those we find in the fossil record. Frogs are the same. Bats are the same. And again, I mentioned before, the first time a bat appears in the fossil record, it's a perfectly formed bat. There's no evolutionary history for bats. Lizards are the same. Centipedes are the same as the centipedes we find alive today. Spiders are the same as those we find alive today. Flying ants are the same as those we find alive. S living uh, snakes, turtles. And snakes and turtles actually pose some additional problems. Uh, turtles in particular, the shell of a turtle is so hard that it would be expected to be found in fossilized forms. Just like the clams, those bones uh, and trees, uh, hard, hard things are expected to be found in fossil forms. This turtle shell is expected to be found in fossil forms, but there's no evolutionary history for the turtle. They just appear, boom, out of nowhere. And same as the snakes. Both of these create uh, problems for uh, evolutionists. Well, I could go on and on. Critics, scorpions, and flies are all the same. Well, let me point out something to understand what the big problem is here. What an, the evolutionary interpretation of these layers of rocks is that these different layers of rocks form because the Earth's environments changed over time dramatically. Like first there was a desert there forming one type of sedimentary rock. Then there was a, then there was a, a swamp there forming a different type of sedimentary rock. Sandstone and then shale formed. And then limestone formed when it was inundated by ocean. And then became a, a coniferous forest for a period of time, leaving the carboniferous layers. And then you went back to an ocean. So the, the different layers to them are due to, in their claims, do the changing environment over time. Well, if life, if environment on earth has changed over time so dramatically, then why on earth do we find so many organisms that are identical today to their ancestors that are in the fossil record? Where is the evolution? They did not evolve. They're exactly the same as they were in, their, in, in, in fossil form. But perhaps the biggest challenge for the secular interpretation of fossils is, is an event, if you will, called the Cambrian Explosion. Now, Cambrian explosion is a name given, to, given not to an event necessarily, but the sudden appearance of life on earth. So sudden, in fact, that it is called an explosion of life. This Time Magazine article called it evolution's big bang. They say, new discoveries show that life as we know it began in an amazing biological frenzy that changed the planet almost overnight. It is called the Cambrian Explosion because it occurred in the geologic era known as the Cambrian. Before this point in the fossil record, all we find is bacteria. That bacteria dating back like 3.9 billion years. Bacteria, 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 in all these layers of fossiliferous rock. Then suddenly, and without explanation, boom. In one brief period of time, we find the vast majority of invertebrate phyla just appear out of nowhere. So sudden that it's called the Cambrian explosion, an explosion of life on Earth. Well, Darwin himself was deeply troubled by the uh, sudden appearance of life in the Cambrian, uh, a, an appearance that he called an inexplicable mystery. In his book on the origin of species, he said this about the Cambrian explosion. There is another, an allied difficulty, which is much more serious I allude to the manner in which many species and several of the main divisions of the animal kingdom appear, suddenly appear in the lowest known fossiliferous rocks. To the question, why we do not find rich fossiliferous deposits belonging to these assumed earlier periods before the Cambrian, I can give no satisfactory answer. They just appear out of nowhere. Well, Darwin's imagined a tree of life that you see here uh, is, is simply not supported by fossils. And, and in fact, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, who we met previously, said nothing distressed Darwin more than the Cambrian explosion. Rather than a slow and gradual accumulation of kinds of organisms, the fossil record shows what it shows is a sudden appearance of life out of nowhere. And then a slow and gradual accumulation of new species, but not new kinds, the kinds appear, are, appear suddenly in the fossil record. All, all evolutionists can really demonstrate is that new variations of the same kind evolve through time. This is what the fossil record shows.
Not the evolutionary tree as Darwin envisioned, starting with one organism and leading to more and more organisms, more and more kinds of organisms. The kinds of organisms appear out of nowhere without any evolutionary history. And then today, all we see is different variations of those kinds that have developed. Well, the different interpretations of the fossil record uh, can, be, can be shown this way. Evolutionists say that fossils show that organisms evolved over long periods of time and were buried in watery sediments through slow and gradual processes. Is that what the fossils show? The biblical view of fossils would argue that fossils show that organisms appear suddenly and were buried rapidly in watery sediments during Noah's flood. The question is, what does the evidence best support? What does the witness of fossils say? Well, Let's summarize the case of the fossils. Do fossils support evolution? No. The sudden appearance of life in the Cambrian argues strongly against a, uh, an evolutionary interpretation. The tremendous absence of transitional forms is a tremendous challenge to the evolutionary interpretation. The abundance of living fossils, the out-of-place fossils, all argue against Darwinian explanations. Well, although Darwin hoped that further fossil hunting would eventually prove his theory true, here we are, 150 years later, and those intermediate forms, those transitional forms, have not been found. The periods of time before the Cambrian have never been found. And believe me, they are looking. Today, the biggest, way to, the biggest road to fame as an evolutionist, as a paleontologist, is to find those transitional forms. And they have been scouring the globe looking for them. But here we are, 150 years later, they're no closer to filling in Darwin's tree of life than they were when he originally drew it. Do fossils support the biblical flood? Yes, they do. The lateral continuity of strata is a monumental body of evidence for the global flood. The abundance of marine fossils, the highly preserved nature of fossils, and those mass mortality beds of fossils all argue for a global flood model of fossil origins. The fossiliferous strata does make up a record. It is a fossil record, but not a record of life on Earth over hundreds of millions of years, as argued by evolutionists. Despite the abundance of evidence to support the event, where you side on this debate may ultimately be determined by where you place your authority of truth. Do you place it with man's fallibility or with God's sovereign word? When the fossil record is interpreted correctly, it is clear that the, it is clear and a monumental testimony to the terrible flood described in the Bible. The sorting of fossils merely represents the destruction of successive life zones or biomes by the rising flood water. Well, when the fossil record is correctly understood and interpreted as being the result of a global flood, it's easy to see that there is no evidence that the earth is older than the biblical historical account. Hundreds, in fact, hundreds of natural processes can be used to determine the upper limit of the age of the earth, and many of these conflict with the idea that the, that the earth is billions of years old, and they show a maximum possible age much, much less than is required for evolution. Well, there was a global flood, and the fossil record is, again, a monumental body of evidence to this event. There is no larger body of evidence for any specific event than there is for the global flood. And yet, they deliberately ignored the fact that the world was deluged with water and perished. Well, interpreting these rocks otherwise has been devastating. And I think uh, this is the biggest problem. Um, of course, by teaching evolution, they're teaching, our, you know, teaching people, teaching young people that they're nothing but an evolved ape. You know, that their life has no purpose. And uh, I think it's one of the main reasons why we need to address this, this issue. But, but there's another reason why... In, why the, problem with them reinterpreting these layers of fossiliferous rocks in support of deep time, in support of slow and gradual accumulations. And that is because of what these rocks were always meant to mean. Now, we know why God sent the flood to destroy the wickedness of the human race on the earth in those days. But if you, if you look at it biblically, many times when God enacted judgment upon people, he used uh, other things like plagues. Plagues would sweep out amongst the, the Israel, uh, Israelites when they, were in, when they were in the wilderness. Snakes, in one case. But he did, it, he did it this case with a global flood. And I believe he did it this way, instead of by a plague, which would have less, left no lasting evidence. I believe that he did it this way to leave a memorial, a monument, if you will, to remind us 
of one thing, and that's just how much God hates sin. He wanted to leave an everlasting memorial to us to remind us just how much God hates sin. And when they reinterpreted the fossil record, they took that away, that important reminder away of just how much God hates sin. And his hatred of sin has never changed. It's never changed. The church, the modern church, has kind of softened God's nature. They talk all about God's love and don't talk about his hatred of not just the sin, but of the sinner. His hatred of sin has never changed. The God that destroyed that world by flood, that terrible event, killing all of those people, all of those plants, all of those animals, that is the God that we will appear before one day. The writer of Hebrews says it is a terrifying thing to be in the hand of the Almighty God. And one day we will stand there in the hand of the Almighty God, giving an account for the sins that were in our life. And I have to think, not only has God's hatred of sin not changed, but it's probably worse today. Because unlike it was unlike the time of Noah, we live in the time following the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. We're sinning now knowing that his son died for us. And I think God's hatred of sin in a person's life now, with that knowledge, has to be greater than it was to, for the sinner back in Noah's day. Well, Jesus reminded us, again, that the, that the latter judgment will come much as the first also. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married, they were given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. His judgment is coming again. And it will come suddenly and unexpectedly as it did in the days of Noah. But just as God provided Noah a way to be saved from the coming judgment, so he's provided us a way through his son, Jesus. All we have to do is repent. He asks for forgiveness. He has paid the penalty for us. All we have to do is ask forgiveness for those sins in the name of, of Jesus, the name of Yeshua, and Repent. But unfortunately, not a lot of people talk about repentance these days when they talk about what is required for salvation. Repentance is required for salvation. You must commit within yourself, commit to God to no longer do those sins. Now, we all make mistakes and we all sin, but it's living with sin in your life that separates you from God. And if you die in that state, you will go to hell. Repentance is a requirement for salvation. It is a requirement. If you know there's sin in your life, you got to get rid of, got rid of that, get rid of that sin. And to, to help with that, we have the Holy Spirit. That is one of the helps that the Holy Spirit brings, is the conviction. So if you're struggling with sin in your life, if there's a sin that's been there, maybe you heard the conviction at one point in time, but pers the persistence of that sin has caused you to grow cold to that conviction. If you no longer feel that conviction any longer, pray for it. Pray for renewed conviction. If you want to stop that sin, if you want to repent and you're having trouble, pray for the conviction, a, a powerful conviction. Pray for a powerful conviction that will lead to tears to help you overcome that sin that's in your life. God wants you to turn from those sins. He's given the Holy Spirit to help us with that. But repentance is a requirement. It is definitely a requirement for salvation. Just remember, we will stand in the hand of the Almighty God one day and uh, give an account for the sins that are in our life, sins that we committed knowing that Jesus died for us. And I tell you, I'm a bit terrified. Remember, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. I'm not just fearful, but I'm a bit terrified to appear before the hand, appear before the Almighty God because of the enormity of the sins that have been in my life. I'm going to put the quiz up. Anyone who takes the quiz and closes out in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for your, for your son, we thank you so much for your son who's died to pay the penalties for our sins, Lord, and we are so sorry. So, so sorry that we have sinned knowing that he died for us. We're so sorry, Lord. Help us, Lord, we ask. Father, we truly want to walk the path of righteousness, but we struggle. Your creatures struggle so greatly, Lord. Help us, Lord. Send the Holy Spirit to us, Lord, and help us, Lord. Help us. Give us the conviction that will lead to repentance and help us walk the path of righteousness, Father God. Help our life to be a witness for you, to our life to glorify and honor you, our life to be a witness that will lead other people to a saving knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father God, thank you for sending your Son, Lord. And thank you for your word. 
your Bible that has given us such tremendous insight, we would truly be lost today. Not just lost salvationally, but lost not understanding the true history of the world. But through the insights that we have from your word, Father, we know that there was a flood, that the fossil record is a record of that terrible event. Father God, thank you for your word that has given us such tremendous insight. Father, we pray for wisdom. Father, give us wisdom. There's so many intellectual people, so many scientists arguing for a different history of the world, Father, using science to support a a history of the world that is different, that is wrong, that is false teachings, all a bunch of lies. Father God, help us, give us wisdom to help us understand the claims of science, these false teachings and these lies. Help us to understand the science. Give us wisdom to help us understand so that we can be a better witness for you, Father God. We ask for wisdom, Lord God, we ask. Father, give us wisdom, Lord. Help us to be a better witness for you, Father God, and give us opportunities to witness, we ask. Send people to us that need to hear the truths that we hold to and help us to be bold at that time. Embolden us, Lord, when the opportunity presents itself to witness to someone. Help us to not shrink back from the science, the claims of science, because we know we are in possession of the truth. We know the truth. And all that's a bunch of lies. Help us to confront those lies with the truths that we hold to and help us to be bold about it, Lord. Give us boldness to speak, boldness to share the truths that we hold to, Lord. And help us save these young people that are being taught a bunch of lies. Father God, thank you, Lord, for your word that's given us these insights. We ask for wisdom to help us understand the science, Lord. And and we ask for your Holy Spirit to help us repent, Lord, and walk the path of righteousness, Father God. Father God, we praise you. We glorify and honor you. We thank you so much for this wonderful world that you've made, for the life that you've given us, Lord, and for your grace and mercy to forgive us as terrible sinners as we are. Father God, thank you so much. In Jesus' name, we pray all these things. Amen.